Welcome back to ECE 320A. Hopefully we'll get through today's class. But as a way of announcement, your next homework assignment, homework number three, is due a week from Thursday. That's the 10th of October, and that's dealing with Laplace transforms, which the first thing that we want to do is recap what we were trying to do or introduced before the exam. I don't know how much we're, how many were paying attention since you were focused on the exam. And I do have those graded and hopefully that will be returned. So keep me aware of the time and I'll try to stop a little early so that we can return those. <clears throat> then the second, I was going to pick up with the differential equation that we started or with, that we worked on the last time, but I'll let you go back and review that and I'll actually work one of your homework problems, sort of, or part of it, maybe, or at least get you started by deriving a differential equation for a circuit. That's the second topic that we'll try to do and then we'll start going through the Laplace transform. What does it mean when we Laplace transform an integral. What does that give us? We'll look at signals, some specific signals as far as Laplace transform pairs, what those signals are in the time domain and what those then look like when we Laplace transform those signals because we want this machinery, these Laplace transform tools so that we can do our circuit analysis with algebra. Maybe people aren't as comfortable with differential equations. We'll do that a little bit, but then if you do do the differential equations, you can actually solve those using Laplace transforms, or we can immediately take these circuits and take their Laplace transform equivalents, create a new circuit, and now perform your KVL and KCL analysis with algebra in the frequency domain with the S variable, and then at the very end, inverse Laplace transform to figure out what your time domain waveform looks like as far as a voltage or a current, whatever it is that you're after in that particular circuit. And that's why it's important that we understand what these Laplace transform pairs are relative to an impulse, a sinusoid, exponentially damped sinusoids. We'll talk then about Laplace transform theorems. What does that mean? If we now shift our time domain waveform in the time domain, what does that do in the frequency domain? What's the corresponding relationship in the frequency domain? Also, we'll talk about this S translation. What happens when we translate our frequency variable by some amount. Well, that's like decaying our waveform in the time domain with an exponential decay rate. And we'll talk about scaling. Those are some Laplace transform theorems or operational transforms that you can do once you already have, let's say, a collection of Laplace transform pairs and you need to get a slight variation from that particular Laplace transform pair. As a recap of what we talked about last time, <clears throat> we defined the Laplace transform. That takes this time domain waveform f of t, which could be associated with a signal. It could be associated with a system. The system being maybe its impulse response. That might be an h of t. But we now have a way of collecting or examining this waveform over all time, the entire time horizon from zero up to infinity, weighting that with this complex exponential e to the minus st, and that allows us to boil all of this time domain information into frequency domain data, and that's what we get with this capital F of s. So we're really going from a time domain into another domain, which is the frequency domain. And we want to be able to go back and forth and work in both domains. But I think most students right now prefer to go into the frequency domain, do their algebra, and then at the end, inverse Laplace transform and get back into the time domain. All of your circuit analysis then can be done with algebra instead of worrying about solving differential equations and writing differential equations for a circuit. But it's nice to be able to do both. We looked at the Laplace transform of a unit step. 
And this unit step sometimes will use that as a switch. Meaning if you look at this, this is, has a value of one for all non-negative values of time t. And if we multiplied that by some waveform, that will cause that waveform to only be present for non-negative values of time. And so sometimes you'll see this U of T multiplying some waveform, but really that's just turning that waveform on when this time domain waveform or this unit step is active. We Laplace transformed that and found that it's this one over S. We're gonna get these polynomials, ratios of polynomials of S. This particular signal has a Laplace transform of 1 over S, and I want you to start getting comfortable with sketching in the complex plane. This S plane is actually the complex plane. We have the real values of S, and we have the imaginary values of S. That particular ratio of polynomials in S has a zero in the denominator right at the origin at s equals zero. Zeros of our denominator we will call poles and we'll represent those by x's in this complex s plane. Zeros of a transfer function which are zeros in the numerator will represent those by open circles. And so now we'll be plotting x's and o's and we won't be on a basketball court or a football court. We'll be in the ECE classroom, sketching X's and O's, and that will make sense to us. Now it'll, we'll understand what's going on with X's and O's. Somebody goes, give me your X's and O's, and you'll be able to see what that means. You'll start to see what that means relative to system behavior and signal behavior. We also talked about what happens when we Laplace transform a derivative. Now we're Laplace transforming an operation the operation being differentiation. And that then, when x of t has a Laplace transform capital X of s, if we now want to look at the Laplace transform of the derivative of x of t, we simply scale that capital X of s with the frequency variable s. And if it was had a non-zero initial condition at time t equals zero minus, we need to account for that and that's this minus x of zero minus. A lot of times we'll have zero initial conditions, and in that case, when we take the Laplace transform of a derivative, we don't have to worry about these additional pieces or terms that we might be subtracting off of that expression. That's where we were before the exam, and then we actually derive the differential equations for a series RLC circuit, and we got all the way through that, so I thought, why don't we just look at another one so that you get a little bit more practice deriving differential equations for a given circuit. And this is problem 1227, which is one of the problems in your book, or for homework number three. We have a source. And in this case, I sub G is not specified. It's undeter It's not specified or it's not told what that actually is as a function of time. So you just have to assume when you Laplace transform it that that's capital I sub G of S. And it will depend on what it actually is, what that capital I sub G of S is. But if it's not yet specified, all you can say is this is a generic waveform I sub G of T. That's our current source, we then apply that to an RLC combination, and in order to create a situation where we have zero initial conditions, let's have that switch closed until we say, let's look at what happens. Then we open the switch, the source gets applied, and now we start to see what happens with the currents and voltages in this particular circuit. Here's our capacitor, here's our inductor, here's our resistor, and in the book, they actually want us to look at 
these two variables, the voltage across the inductor and the voltage across the capacitor, and that's how we will be deriving our differential equations. And hopefully it's clear with that switch closed <coughs> that there's no voltage across any of those elements. So you've shorted out those elements. We now have zero initial conditions before time t equals zero. And what we are wanting to do then is analyze this circuit for non-negative values of time. After throwing the switch open, now we've energize or we've placed that signal source I sub G of T into the circuit and now let's figure out what's going on. What would you expect if somebody said now you're in a job interview and you're all nervous and they say give me the differential equation for this circuit. What are some basic ideas you can start talking about to give yourself some time to start thinking about what's going on with this circuit. Now what's important in circuit analysis is do you have devices, if this was a purely resistive circuit, then all of your voltages and currents would be shaking together, wouldn't they? There wouldn't be any delay. There wouldn't be any energy storage in this moving back and forth of charge and voltage between the different elements. But once we start introducing inductors and capacitors, now we have magnetic fields that are energizing and collapsing. We have electric fields that are building up and discharging. Now we have this sharing of information or signals back and forth we have energy storage in our system. And how many energy storage devices do we have in this circuit? Two. We have one inductor and one capacitor. What's the order then of that circuit? If somebody said, what's the order of this differential equation going to be generically for generic values of R, L, and C? Now you know it's going to be a second order. Or it might be two first order differential equations. And they're going to be coupled. So now you know, okay, I need to be looking for something that involves two first-order differential equations or one second-order differential equation just by knowing that I have two energy storage devices in that circuit. Is that clear? And if, as you go through this, your denominator generically will be an S squared. It will be second order. It'll be a second order polynomial. That's what you're looking for. Obviously, the I sub G, whatever that is, that might introduce some other terms in the denominator, but the circuit naturally itself produces two energy storage devices, or it has two energy storage devices, and that gives you a second order behavior. With those two energy storage devices, you're looking then at a second order system of equations. Or you might be finding that it's easier to think of that as two coupled first order differential equations. And we now want to figure out what those are. But any time now, let's say you're in the interview and you're still trying to buy yourself time, you're going, okay, what did Tharp talk about? And then you can just say, Eli the Iceman. And maybe that'll score some points. Maybe not, but maybe it'll buy you some time. So now you go, Eli the Iceman, what did he mean by that? All I remember is Eli and Ice. Well, Eli and ICE are mnemonic ways of trying to remember the current voltage relationships for inductors and capacitors. E and I on the left, that's the variable of interest. Here we're using E to be voltage. And the L and the C are the inductor and capacitor equations. So Eli says that the voltage 
of an inductor is equal to some relationship on the last two letters in Eli. Well, you just have L and then you differentiate that last variable. And now you have V is equal to L di dt. And I always tell students you need to know that this semester and until you retire. If you're an electrical and computer engineer, you need to know V is equal to L di dt. Okay, maybe you'll retire in a couple of years. That's fine. But you need to know from now until when you retire. Also, you need to remember ICE. And that says the current through this capacitor, I sub C of T, is now C dV sub C dT. And with these particular relationships, you can do a lot. But once you have these, really the variables of interest are typically, or let me say that it's usually best, to try to write your equations in terms of those highlighted variables, inductor currents and capacitor voltages. And you may find derivatives of those, but those are the variables you want to concentrate on. So it's usually best to write these differential equations or any of your equations in terms of inductor currents. And again, you can start remembering this by Eli and Ice. And Eli and Ice, if we go back to exam one material, which maybe a lot of you are not wanting to do, but you're going to have to know that for the final. Eli and Ice tell you the relationship between the voltage and current in terms of leading and lagging. Eli says voltage is ahead of the current in an inductor. I says the current leads the voltage in a capacitor. So that's another way you can use Eli and Ice. But here we're using it to understand these current voltage relationships of inductors and currents. And so we're saying inductor currents and capacitor voltages. Have we bought ourselves enough time? Shoot, he hadn't forgotten that he asked me to find the differential equation of this circuit. I was hoping maybe he'd ask me another question. That's the interviewer. <clears throat> now what do we do? How would you analyze this circuit? And there's many different ways of doing it. But what are what do you see jumping out at you now if you look at that circuit and you say, okay, I need to somehow write some equations for that circuit. What do I do? Can you write a mesh in that left-hand loop? Mm, you don't know what the voltage drop across that source is, do you? So that's maybe not going to work. But that's the way you think about this. You go, okay, that's two meshes. Let me see if I can write some mesh equations. Although you could say that mesh is I sub G. And then you could say that's defined. You could say, okay, I don't need to worry about the voltage drops. I already know that current in that left mesh is just defined as I sub G. And now you could write one mesh equation in the right-hand side. But you're probably looking to find two equations for this. What if we said, why don't I look at this particular node and write a KCL at that node? And if I remember what was just said, maybe I would really like to write my equations in terms of I sub L and V sub C, which are I sub L and V sub 2. But the book wants you to write it in terms of V sub 1 and V sub 2. So we'll accommodate their request. But if I now write KCL at that first circle, let me call that A, node A. I 
I have I sub G coming in from the left, and I have I sub L going down out of that through the inductor, and then I have actually, I could write it many different ways, but let me just say I sub C coming out. So the KCL there says that I sub G of T, the source current is equal to I sub L of T plus I sub C of T. <clears throat> that doesn't look very differential, does it? But what do you know ICE? ICE provides you with a current voltage relationship for your capacitor and you said probably it's preferable to write these equations in terms of inductor currents and capacitor voltages. If we now get rid of that current or rewrite that capacitor current in terms of its voltage, this equation now is going to be C and in terms of the variables that were defined in the circuit, that I believe was V sub 2 dt. And if somebody said, you know what, I don't want that I sub L in there, I actually want V sub 1. Well, you can relate I sub L and V sub 1 if you want, and they'll call this an integral differential equation. So they're mixing integrals and derivatives together. I sub L of T from Eli, that's not Eli, is it? So Eli tells us that V sub 1 of T, the voltage dropped across that inductor, is L D I sub L DT. And then we could say that I sub L of T is 1 over L integral of V sub 1 from, let's say, 0 minus up to T tau D tau. And we could now replace that or use that to rewrite that equation. We now have 1 over L integral 0 minus to T V sub 1 of tau D tau plus C dV sub 2 of T dT. We now have a relationship between V1 and V2, but we probably want one more equation because we're going to need to write our equation in terms of just V sub 2 of T. Again, you can find equations many different ways, but let me find another equation by writing a mesh equation now. Suppose I write a mesh equation, a KVL equation there. So, I don't know, let me call that mesh B. And I have minus V1 of T plus the voltage dropped across that resistor. If I'm going around that mesh the way I've drawn it, plus V sub 2 of T or V sub C of T. The book wants us to keep it in terms of V1 and V2, but V sub R is nowhere in the book. But we can rewrite that in terms of V sub 1 and V sub 2, because that voltage drop across the resistor is just R times the current going from left to right, and that's the capacitor current, and we know how to write that based on I's. So this now says that we can find another equation 
from this one by replacing v sub r or just rewriting v sub r as r times i, but that's i sub c, which is c dv sub 2 of t dt plus v sub 2 of t is equal to 0. Now you have two equations in these two variables, v1 and v2. If you Laplace transform those and get rid of v sub 1, you'll be able to get part b, I think, of your problem. This is part a, basically, of that problem on your homework. So there's your gift for coming to class today. <clears throat> Questions on that? How to write differential equations associated with the circuit. And now you've got your job offer, right? Because you've come up with the differential equations that govern the dynamic behavior of that circuit. And you know a lot now about that circuit with these in hand. Now you can go to MATLAB and simulate this as much as you want if that's what you want to do. Okay? Or you can go into the lab. You could get some R's and C's and L's from Josie and start simulating this and seeing if what you're measuring is consistent with the solutions that you created in 320A. Now, if we wanted to Laplace transform these equations, we already know how to Laplace transform little i sub g of t. That's just going to be, since it's not specified, that will just be capital I sub g of s. We know how to Laplace transform a derivative. We derived that last time. What's the Laplace transform of an integral? So let's now look at that, and once we have that, then we're good to go for that particular problem. Let's now look at the Laplace transform of another operation, not differentiation, but now it's integration. Notationally, then, if we want the Laplace transform of the integral of f of tau, or f of t, then we just plug that mess into the expression for our Laplace transform definition, which is the integral from t equals 0 minus to infinity of this function, which is now this integral, from 0 minus to t of f of tau d tau e to the minus s t dt. And I have to kind of keep track of my variables of integration. And now if we want to change the signals inside the integral, maybe get rid of some integrals, maybe we need to do integration by parts again. And what we'll do now is suppose that we now say, let's let V of T in our integration by parts formula be this integral from 0 minus to t of f of tau d tau. And let's let dw equal e to the minus st dt. So there's our w and here's our v. Integration by parts, then we need to find dv. And what's the derivative of that integral? The differential of that integral. Maybe I'll go ahead and put my argument of t here. We differentiate an integral, we'll get the waveform back. And 
then now if we integrate dw, what happens when we integrate that right-hand side? e to the minus st dt. We're integrating with respect to time, so that minus 1 over s comes out, and we have e to the minus st. So there's our v, dw, and dvw. Now we simply say that v, the integral of v, w, is now going to equal vw that's v dw that's now going to equal v times w v was this integral from 0 minus to t of f of tau d tau w is this minus 1 over s e to the minus st and we evaluate that from 0 minus and infinity. So there is our VW. And then we have to subtract this minus integral of W dV. And W was this minus 1 over s e to the minus st. And dv was f of t dt from 0 minus to infinity. Now we just need to follow through the steps. We need to evaluate that first expression at the upper limit and the lower limit. We now have this minus 1 over s e to the minus st, but we're replacing t now with its upper limit. And we now have this integral from 0 to infinity of f of tau d tau. We're assuming that function f of tau is well behaved, so that integral is bounded. And if that's the case, now we can just have this e to the minus s infinity annihilating that whole term, so that becomes zero. We now evaluate it at the lower limit, which is now this 1 over s e to the minus s zero integral from zero minus to 0 minus, but now if we integrate over nothing, that's 0. So those two pieces, that first term evaluated at the two limits, is nothing. Now we need to play a little bit with this second term. which is right there. And now I can combine those two negative signs to give me a plus. I'm integrating with respect to time, so the 1 over s can come out front. And I now have this integral from 0 minus to infinity. And let me just commute those terms in my integrand so that maybe something will pop out at us. And I'm hoping that that looks very reassuring, that piece. That's the definition of our Fourier transform. So that now the Laplace transform of an integral is basically the inverse operation of a derivative. Remember our derivative was multiplication by s. Now we integrate in the time domain. That's dividing by s. That's now the Laplace transform of our integral.
another Laplace transform operation. So that's an operation, integration, and when we Laplace transform that time domain operation of integration, we actually are just dividing by S in the frequency domain. Now you can Laplace transform those differential, integral differential equations. You now have, you know how to Laplace transform derivatives, integrals, and generic waveforms. But now if I give you a specific waveform, can you find the Laplace transform of a specific waveform? You can do it for a unit step. What's the Laplace transform of a unit step? 1 over S. Let's derive some other Laplace transform pairs for different signals or waveforms. What if we Laplace transform an impulse? You know what an impulse is, right? You have an impulse hammer. If you're a mechanical engineer, you excite your system with a hammer. This impulse hammer, well, we're electrical engineers, so we use this impulse waveform. And what's that really do? Well, that's energizing instantly the energy storage elements in our circuit, and then we just watch it its natural response after those initial conditions are energized. That impulse is basically energizing all of these inductors and capacitors and then you just watch it die out, your signals. Now we need to go into the kitchen. Don't you guys cook when you're doing your electrical and computer engineering? Sure. What are you doing if I gave you that mathematical operation and I said, okay, you have a waveform F of T, you scale it or you hit it with an impulse and now integrate that for all time. What's the result of that operation? And I'm suggesting that that's somewhat related to something that might happen in the kitchen. <clears throat> huh? Well, it's old school kitchen, so now I'm dating myself. What? So now you go to the grocery store and you buy your flour. This will be a quiz. What's on your flour container? What does it say that flour is? Does it say anything about the properties of that flour? The color, it could be wheat or bleached, but that's not what we want. We don't want to bleach this, do we? But that's fine. That's what could be on the, the container of flour. But now, I'm, now it's always pre-sifted. But in the good old days, we had to get a sifting device, and that's why I'm doing this, because you used to have to, you'd pour your flour into this little container that looks kind of like a coffee can. I guess they don't sell coffee in coffee cans anymore. But it had these little devices at the bottom and a mesh, and it would sift your flour, and the flour would fall at the bottom, and now you can bake with it. Now you can cook. You can make pies. Ha. Ah right pi so now this is this impulse does the same thing it does a sifting operation what's it doing the only time when this argument inside that integral is going to be anything happening is when that impulse is activated right and that impulse is only on or activated at one instant of time all the other times it's zero. So the only possibility is that this particular mathematical concept 
is simply going to sift out the integrand's value at time at the time when that impulse is on. That impulse is on at what time? What time t? When the argument is zero. Now, what's it do? You simply sift that function f of t's value out of that integral and that's what you get from this mathematical operation when you hit that f of t with an impulse and this is what we're going to we have to use this sifting property to derive the Laplace transform of an impulse now if this is true what would you get if I did something like that. Now what's going to come out of that mathematical expression? The only time that impulse is going to be on is at what time? When its argument is zero. So when t minus t zero is zero, or when t is equal to t naught. And then it's just going to evaluate or pull out that function's value at that instant of time. And that's what you will get from this mathematical expression. Again, you're sifting. Okay, now that we know this sifting property, what's the Laplace transform? Of an impulse. Okay, you're buying time in the interview, right? You just write down the definition. You remember the definition of a Laplace transform, and you, you've already impressed your interviewer, right? You say, oh, that's the integral from 0 minus to infinity of the function, which in this case is delta of t, an impulse, scaled by this complex exponential e to the minus st. s is a complex number. It can have real values, of imaginary values. It has real and imaginary parts. It's a complex number. And we're looking at that overall time. Now if we do the same operation that we just did, what's our f of t in this integral? e to the minus st. That's our f of t. And what's that impulse going to do? It's going to sift out that function and evaluate that function when the impulse is active. That impulse is active when? equals zero, right? So now we take e to the minus s and we evaluate it when that impulse is on. e to the zero. So the impulse, the Laplace transform of an impulse is just one. That's about as easy as you can get. And you can then just say that this is now so that you can Remember to go into the kitchen. That's provided to us by the sifting property. All right, now we know how to Laplace transform a unit step. We know how to Laplace transform an impulse. What else do we use to excite our circuits? Sinusoids. Let's look at and see what the Laplace transform of sinusoids are. But before we do that, I'm going to do a little history lesson. No, not really history, but I'm going to go back to somebody that was very influential, Euler. And Euler tells us how to write sines and cosines in terms of exponentials.
So if we can integrate an exponential, then we can integrate, or if we can Laplace transform exponentials, then we can Laplace transform sines and cosines. That's the idea. So let's see what happens if we now Laplace transform e to the gamma t, where gamma is yet to be decided what that will be. I may make that a real number, I may make it complex. But if we just do this one for the generic gamma, the definition of our Laplace transform says we integrate from 0 minus to infinity of the waveform e to the gamma t, weight it by e to the minus st dt. And now we can utilize our understanding of exponents, and we can combine those two waveforms. And now you know how to integrate e to the minus something t. That's going to be 1 over minus something the e to the minus s minus gamma and we evaluate at the two limits. But what happens at the upper limit? We plug in t equal infinity that goes away doesn't it? We have e to the minus infinity. That's a z going to zero. So our upper limit is gone. We now have a minus 1 over minus s minus gamma e to the minus s minus gamma zero. That just becomes one. We can collect our minus signs and we have one over s minus gamma. And now we know what this generic Laplace transform of e to the gamma t results in. 1 over s minus gamma. Let's build a chart. And let's look at different possibilities for gamma. We have gamma, we have e to the gamma t, and then we have Laplace of e to the gamma t. Suppose we looked at negative values of gamma. Now we're saying that sigma is a positive real number. Let's look at gamma equal to minus sigma. So now we want to Laplace transform a decaying exponential. And you can see that, right? In the time domain. That's just e to the minus 4t, e to the minus 7t, e to the minus t. That's this decaying exponential. What's its Laplace transform going to be? Now we simply replace gamma with minus sigma in our formula, and we end up with 1 over s plus sigma. And if we went into the complex s plane to draw poles and zeros, now we're playing with x's and o's. Do I have any o's? Do I have any finite values of s that cause this to vanish? This 1 over s plus sigma. There's no numerator term involving s, is there? So there's no finite value of s. I don't have any circles. Where is my... So I have x's. How many x's do I have? What's the order of the denominator polynomial? What's the order of my denominator polynomial 1 over s plus sigma? s raised to the what power? 1. It's first order. So how many roots do I have? How many values of s cause that denominator to vanish? 1. And what's the value of s that causes that denominator to vanish? Minus sigma. So now I go over here in the s plane. 
to minus sigma, and now I have one pole at minus sigma, and that's what this pole zero diagram of one over s plus sigma would look like. What about if I said, well, that was fun, but why don't I go complex? What if I let gamma be j omega, j being the square root of minus 1? Now I have e to the j omega t. And what's that going to do? I now replace gamma with j omega. I now have 1 over s minus j omega. If I looked in the s plane again, would I have any open circles or zeros? Do I have any finite values of s that cause that ratio of values of s to vanish? No, there's nothing in the numerator, is there? What's the value of s that causes the denominator to vanish or give me a pole? j omega, right? So now I'm up here. Whoops. At j omega. And I actually have complex coefficients in that denominator polynomial. And we aren't going to be working with complex coefficients. We <clears throat> will always have real coefficients, and so we're going to have to have, when we have a complex, we're going to have to have its complex conjugate together. So if we had a pole at j omega, we'll have its buddy or twin or cousin at minus j omega, which is available to us if we look at minus j omega for gamma. Now we have e to the minus j omega t. That gives us 1 over s plus j omega. Now we have in the s plane this value of s equal to minus j omega. And if we combine 1 over s minus j omega and 1 over s plus j omega, we would get those two conjugate values of for poles. For completeness, why don't we just look at what happens for sigma greater than zero. We now have e to the sigma t, and what's that? And if I had to plot x's and o's in the s-plane, where would I plot the pole for this guy? Where would it be? The value of s that causes that denominator to vanish is a positive sigma. That's in the right half plane, and we're going to learn that poles in the right half plane <coughs> What happens to this as a function of time with sigma being positive? e to the 4t, what's that do? e to the 8t, e to the 1t. It's blowing up. It's going unbounded, isn't it? If we have x's over here in the right half plane, whether they're real or have complex parts, that gives rise to unstable behavior. So we want our poles, if we're de designing nice, well-behaved circuits, we want our x's to be in the left half plane. We want there to be damping. We want these e to the minus 6t, e to the minus 4t in our circuits. We want this exponential damping. Now we're ready to do what we said we were going to do, which was Laplace transform sinusoids. We have the pieces to play with. What if I now Laplace transform cosine 
of omega t. And I say that we already have the pieces. Well, now we have to invoke Euler and rewrite cosine omega t as this combination of complex exponentials, which is e to the j omega t plus e to the minus j omega t all over 2. Or now, the Laplace transform of a cosine, we can split into two pieces. We have one half the Laplace transform of e to the j omega t, and we just have that in our table, plus one half Laplace transform of e to the minus j omega t, and we have that in our table. That's why we built the table. We didn't do it for nothing, did we? <clears throat> so, what do we have? We now have one half over, what was the Laplace transform of e to the j omega t? 1 over s minus j omega. So now I have an s minus j omega plus a 1 half over s plus j omega. Well, that's the Laplace transform of a cosine, but maybe you haven't seen it that way before. Maybe you've seen it with real coefficients, so let's clean that up a little bit. Let's get a common denominator. We now have an s minus j omega, s plus j omega, so that we now have 1 half times s plus j omega, and we have a plus 1 half s minus j omega. What's going to happen in the denominator? S minus J, S plus J. Those J pieces all go away, don't they, when we do the FOIL. And we're left with S squared minus J squared omega squared. But J squared is minus 1, so a minus a minus the denominator ends up giving us s squared plus omega squared. And what were we Laplace transform? Cosine of omega t. So now you know that the denominator better contain s squared plus omega squared if you're Laplace transforming cosine omega t. What's upstairs? We have one half s plus one half s. The j's all go away, don't they? What's the pole zero diagram going to look like for this? Do I have any open circles? Do I have any finite values of s that cause that ratio of polynomials in S to vanish. What value of S or S's would cause that to vanish to equal zero? Zero, right? If you let S equal zero, that's going to vanish. So now we have an open circle right there at the origin. That's a zero. Where are my poles? If you did the, if you now factored s squared plus omega squared, that's just what we started with, s minus j omega times x plus j omega. You solve those for s, and you see that you have one pole at j omega, another pole at minus j omega, and that's your pole zero diagram for this cosine. What about the Laplace transform of a sine wave? Well, if we invoke Euler again and factor out 
this common term, we will see that we have 1 over 2j times the Laplace transform of e to the j omega t minus 1 over 2j Laplace transform of e to the minus j omega t And now we have this S minus J omega, S plus J omega. Upstairs we have S plus J omega and minus S minus J omega. What happens when we simplify? I'll do the easy part. The denominator, what's it look like? So now, whether you Laplace transform a sine or a cosine at the same frequency, the denominator looks the same. The only distinction is what the numerator looks like. The numerator is going to be different. What happens, the S's cancel each other in the numerator. And we have j omega minus a minus j omega. Or we have j2 omega. The j2 cancels the j2 in the denominator. And now we see that when we Laplace transform a sinusoid, we end up not with an s in the numerator, but with a constant, our frequency omega in the numerator. Well, this is kind of fun. Let's keep going. So now you know how to Laplace transform a unit step. What's that? 1 over S. What's the Laplace transform of an impulse? 1. What's the Laplace transform of cosine of T? S over S squared plus 1, right? If it's just a frequency of 1 radian per second. What about if we Laplace transform a pulse. Maybe that's what you want to excite your circuit with. Suppose you now apply to your circuit the time domain waveform that I'm calling Z of T. Let's say it has an amplitude of A. It starts at T1 and it turns off at T sub 2. And I'm saying that you already have enough information to Laplace transform this. If you simply get a little bit creative with how you define Z of T. You could write that as a linear combination of signals we've already played with. If I didn't turn it off at T sub 2, what would this look like? a delayed unit step. But if I turn it off, all I'm doing is subtracting a unit step at that time t sub 2 when it's getting turned off. Meaning I'm now going to write z of t and let me just go ahead and put my negative sign there, so that now there's Z1, turns on at T1, and all I have to do is get rid of that at time T sub 2, and I can do that I subtract an equal amplitude waveform z sub 2 just turning on at z sub 2.
So how do I do this? Do you remember what the Laplace transform of a delayed unit step was? The nice thing about the Laplace transform is it's a linear operation. So I can now say that that's equal to the Laplace transform of Z1 minus the Laplace transform of Z sub 2. And what's the Laplace transform of Z sub 1? Do you remember what that was? What's the Laplace transform of a unit step? You can at least get half of it right. Laplace transform of a unit step, 1 over s. Now you just have to remember what happens when we delay in the time domain. If we have a delay, then that, oh, and this needs to be scaled by a, doesn't it? But now if we delay that in the time domain, that was this multiplication by e to the minus s, the length of time that we delayed, t sub 1. Now if I give you that information, can you Laplace transform z sub 2? Don't you wish this was on the exam? The question is, fill in the blank. Hopefully you would get A over S. And even more, hopefully, you would remember how to delay that in the frequency domain. So that now the Laplace transform of a pulse is a scaled 1 over S. And it has some of these complex exponential terms or pieces in the numerator. So now we know how to Laplace transform some pretty basic waveforms. Now I could start slicing and dicing if I'm in the kitchen, right? Vegematic or wedge or something, I don't know. We can have an infomercial. We've already learned how to sift. Now we can <clears throat> chop and dice waveforms. Well, if we're doing that, we need to figure out how do we operationally convert those into something that we can figure out what the Laplace transform is. And that's what we want to do now is talk about Laplace transform theorems or operational transforms. And in this context, we're going to be assuming that we already know that the time domain waveform f of t has a Laplace transform f of s. All right, we said we were going back into the kitchen. What did we go into the kitchen for before? Sifting. Well, let's change that up just a little bit. about shifting. This is now the shifting theorem. And we already have shown what that is. If I give you now f of t minus t sub 0, what's the Laplace transform of that going to be? You can at least do that, right? If you know what f of t is, I gave that to you in the very first line. f of t, Laplace transforms to capital F of s. Now I might just say, oh, I don't know. I'm going to just shift my 
time equals zero over and I'll just give you capital F of S. But now if somebody doesn't allow you to do that, how do you modify capital F of S if your waveform in the time domain has been delayed T sub zero units of time? What did you do up here? It's that exponential, isn't it? It's e to the minus s t sub zero. Now, I know you want to go home and play with this tonight. So what happens if you do the following? Suppose you now say g of t is cosine omega t minus tau. for all tau, all t, let's say, greater than or equal to tau. So now what I want is g of f's. 